Just before we get started with today's video, the most ironic ad reads that I do because today's video sponsor is Keeps, about keeping your hair and not getting male pattern baldness. I know all about it. I don't use Keeps. It's too late for me. I lost my hair at 25. Keeps was not around then, and I wish it was, because if it was, I probably still have my glorious locks. Two out of three guys are going to have some form of male pattern baldness by the time they are 35. But Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs for treating hair loss, so you might have tried them before, but you've never tried them at a price this low. That's right, if you were thinking, oh, this is medicine, it's going to be expensive, get my wallet out. Well, you couldn't be more wrong. Keep starts at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one thing, no need to schedule a visit to a doctor's office. Just schedule a quick online consult. And a little bit later, discreet package arrives at your door. You pop it open and you use it in the privacy of your own home. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, that's one problem that's not going to fix itself. Do something about it for a limited time. Go to keeps.com forward slash brain food or just click the link in the description below to get 50% off your first order. Brilliant. And now today's video. Choking the chicken, shaking out the curtains. It's a new one to me. Spanking the monkey, lone rangering, polishing the jewel, shaking hands with the milkman, celebrating Palm Sunday, romancing the stone. These are but a few of the colorful euphemisms for what is perhaps humanity's oldest pastime, masturbation. For much of human history, the act of piloting the Millennium Falcon with Han Solo has been mired in controversy and taboo, with religious leaders condemning it as a sin against God and moral guardians and medical experts blaming excessive menage a moi on all manner of personal and societal ills, from impotence and infertility to criminality and madness. But is any of this actually true? Can taking one too many self-guided tours turn your hard drive into a floppy disk, make hair grow on your palms, or even make you go blind? Well, grab your favorite slippery substance, set your browser to incognito mode, and let's get right to it, shall we? In much of the ancient world, dating Rosie Palms and her five daughters was simply a natural part of life, celebrated in art and fertility rituals, and prominently featured in creation myths. The ancient Sumerians, for instance, believed that engaging in manual override increased sexual potency for both men and women, and that the god Enki created the Tigris and Euphrates rivers by ejaculating into their dry riverbeds. Publicly rocking the chasm Bar, however, was still generally frowned upon. For example, ancient Greek philosopher and to disturber extraordinaire Diogenes was infamous for polishing his amphora on the streets of Athens, declaring, If only it were as easy to banish hunger by rubbing my belly. With the rise of Judeo-Christian religions, however, auditioning the five finger puppets came to be seen in an increasingly negative light. The most commonly cited biblical source for the prohibition of jizz solos is the story too much. It's the story of Adan from Genesis chapter 38. Seven and her, Judah's firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Eight, and Judah said unto Anan, Go on to thy brother's wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her, and raise up seed to thy brother. Nine, and Anan knew that the seed would not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. Ten, and the thing which he did was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he slew him also. While Anand's sinful act does not appear to have been masturbation, but rather most probably that of not impregnating his brother's wife, as was his sacred duty. <laughs> okay, Bible. In this case, via the act of coitus interruptus, withdrawing and ejaculating outside of one's partner, ultimately some Jewish and Christian scholars interpreted this story as outlawing any act which resulted in the spilling of seed outside of a woman. The logic being that said seed was reserved exclusively for the act of procreation and wasting it is an affront to God's will. As 5th century Bishop Epinadius of Salamis wrote, they soil their bodies, minds, and souls with unchastity, and they are physically corrupted because they satisfy their appetite, but by the acts of Anan, the son of Judah. For as Anan coupled with Tamar and satisfied his appetite, but did not complete the act by planting his seed for the God-given procreation and did harm himself instead, Others endeavor to get this same filthy satisfaction, not with women, but by other means, and pollute themselves with their own hands. They too imitate the son of Judah, soil the ground with their forbidden practices and drops of filthy fluid, and rub their emissions into the earth. 
with their feet. This interpretation would result in the coining of the term. Onanism do describe the act of polishing the crucifix, but more on that a little later. As Christian thought evolved, the prohibition against thumbing one's rosary became enmeshed in a wider crusade against the very concept of sexual pleasure itself. Early Christians living under the Romans resented the hedonistic lifestyles of their masters and in response began to value chastity and purity as high virtues to which all Christians should aspire. Saint Paul, for instance, claimed that virgins would be the first to be saved at the last judgment. Being something of a realist, however, he also acknowledged that if one could not remain chaste, marriage was the next best thing, and he argued, better to marry than to burn. Saint Jerome, who famously fled into the wilderness to escape earthly temptations, took a more hardline stance, arguing that virginity was natural and that marriage came only after the fall of man. He also considered husbands and wives to be ritually impure and thus unfit to engage in prayer and communion for several days after engaging in sexual intercourse. The most extreme position on the subject, however, was held by St. Augustine, who believed that with enough piety and discipline it was possible to engage in the act of procreation without experiencing sexual pleasure. He backed up this assertion with the wonderfully bizarre argument that some people can make their ears move, either one at a time or both together. There are individuals who can make musical notes issue from the rear of their anatomy, so that you would think they were singing. In paradise, then, generative seed would have been sown by the husband and the wife would have conceived by deliberate and not by uncontrollable lust. Human organs without the excitement of lust could have obeyed the human will for all the purposes of parenthood. What a buzzkill. As will surprise absolutely none of you, dear viewers, the inability of the vast majority of men to live up to such astronomically high standards of pious discipline was inevitably blamed on those most dangerous and morally corrupting of creatures. Women! Scholar Terulian of Carthage was particularly savage in his condemnation of the fairer sex, writing, A woman is a temple built over a sewer. Women, you are the devil's doorway. You lead astray one whom the devil would not dare attack directly. And I think we just found the original incel. The prescription against keynoting at Cupertino was fantastically embraced by 16th and 17th century Puritans, so much so that in the North American colony of New Haven, Connecticut, the act, along with blasphemy and homosexuality, was punishable by the death penalty. But while Jewish, Christian, and Islamic doctrine has long been adamant in its condemnation of one-handed keyboard recitals, it was not until the Age of Enlightenment that the moral crusade against the practice truly took off. In 1716, an English surgeon named John Martin published a pamphlet with the colorful title of Anania, or The Heinous Sin of Self-Pollution and All Its Frightful Consequences. In this pamphlet, he laid out a laundry list of the supposed medical and social ills that were brought about by what he termed onanism after the biblical spiller of seeds. Quote, it manifestly hinders the growth both in boys and girls and few of either sex that in their youth commit this sin to excess for any considerable time come ever to that robustness or strength which they would have arrived to without it. In men as well as boys, the very first attempt of it has often occasioned a famosis, bringing on ulcers and other worse symptoms, especially gonorrhea, more difficult to be cured. The ferment in the testes is destroyed and the seed grown thin and waterish comes away unelaborated without any provocation. This distemper often proves fatal even under the hands of the most skillful. In some, it has been the cause of fainting fits and epilepsies, in others of consumptions, and many young men who were strong and lusty before they gave themselves over to this vice have been worn out by it, and by its robbing of the body of its balmy and vital moisture, sent to their graves as Lance becomes poor by being This dude's f***ing mental. As lad, as lad becomes poor by being overtilled and a few of those that have been much accustomed. Dude. And a few of those that have become much accustomed to this vice in their youth have ever much reason to boast of the fruits of their marriage bed. For if they should get any children, they are commonly weakly ones that either die soon or become tender, sickly people, always ailing and complaining. Is this dude really saying that your kids are going to die because you had a wank too much? Ah! <laughs>
always ailing and complaining, a misery to themselves, a dishonor to the human race, and a scandal to their parents. In women, self-pollution, if frequently practiced, relaxes and spoils the retentive faculty and may draw on a whole legion of diseases that makes them look pale and those who are not of a good complexion swarthy and haggard. It frequently is the cause of hysteric fits, but what it more often produced than either is barrenness and at length a total ineptitude to the act of generation itself. Conveniently for the chronic self-polluter, Martin offered a wide variety of proprietary remedies, including strengthening tincture at 10 shillings and a little prolific powder at 12 shillings a bag. In spite of the transparent self-promoting nature of the pamphlet, Anania proved extraordinarily popular, selling thousands of copies and being printed in 60 editions in several different languages. Martin's work was followed in 1760 by the book Le Onanisme by Swiss physician Samuel Auguste Tissot, who believed that C and contained a man's vital essence, the excessive loss of which led to, quote, a perceptible reduction of strength of memory and even of reason, blurred vision, all the nervous disorders, all types of gout and rheumatism, a weakening of the organs of generation, blood in the urine, disturbance of the appetite, headaches, and a great number of other disorders. Both Martin's and Tissot's works proved highly influential, sparking widespread moral outrage and paranoia over the perceived societal damage inflicted by working from home. Prominent physicians and reformers like Robert James, Benjamin Rush, and James Springer White echoed Martin and Tissot's assertions, claiming that the taming of the shrew sapped one's vital energy and led to moral decay and a host of medical afflictions, including rheumatism, neuralgia, cancer, weakness, headache, memory loss, and inevitably, of course, madness. Even philosophers like Voltaire and Immanuel Kant got in on the action, with the latter even arguing that boxing the one-eyed champ was morally worse than suicide because, quote, a man gives up his personality when he uses himself merely as a means for the gratification of an animal desire. Hysteria over marching one's penguin reached a fever pitch in the mid and late 19th century, with two of the most prominent crusaders being American Presbyterian minister and health reformer Sylvester Graham and doctor and dietitian John Harvey Kellogg. Yes, that Kellogg, the cereal guy. Indeed, both the Graham cracker and cornflakes were originally developed as part of a bland, meatless diet, which Graham and Kellogg believed would curb one's impulse to practice touch typing. For those who persisted in the habit, Kellogg recommended more extreme measures such as tying or bandaging their hands as they slept, locking their genitals in special cages, applying electric shocks, or sewing shut the foreskin of male patients. Good lord, my guy. What are you up to? This latter practice, known as male infibulation, was developed in the 1870s by Carl August Weinholz, an absolute monster and professor of surgery at the University of Hull in Germany. In Weinhold's method, several threads were sewn, oh my god, through the foreskin such that even the mildest of erections would be unbearably painful. Ah, the threads were then sealed with wax. Why? The breaking of which would reveal any attempts to jack the beanstalk. So enthusiastic was Weinhold about infibulation that he recommended performing the method on all bachelors between the ages of 14 and 30 with dim prospects of marriage. The procedure was widely carried out on patients in lunatic asylums with a colleague of Weinhold's writing in 1876. The sensation among the patients was extraordinary. I was struck by the conscious stricken way in which they submitted to the operation on their penises. I mean to try it on a large scale. And and go on wiring all masturbators. Many asylums resorted to even more extreme methods to prevent their patients from charming their snakes or paddling their pink canoes, including straitjacket spiked cock rings known as jug and penises, and in the most extreme cases, the surgical removal of the offending organs themselves. Um, what? Others, including writer Mark Twain, who once gave a comedic speech on the subject, recommended more practical measures such as sewing boys' trousers so that their genitals could not be touched through their pockets, building special school desks that prevented students from crossing their legs. Twain legend. He's being sarcastic, by the way, and preventing girls from riding horses or bicycles. It's worth noting here that this crusade was also responsible for the wide scale adoption of non religious circumcision. The traditional practice of male circumcision is thought to have originated as a type of ritual offering, a fertility gift bestowed to the gods. The idea went that one's foreskin was the minimum possible offering one could make in gratitude. Among early Israelite tribes, circumcision was performed to differentiate individuals as members of the tribe and symbolize their special covenant with 
was God. In 1908, however, British surgeon and pathologist Sir Jonathan Hutchison performed a pamphlet recommending that all boys be circumcised to discourage them from flogging their dolphins, arguing that friction from the foreskin was too stimulating and that its removal would make spanking the monkey too painful and eventually lead to a dulling of sensation. This effectively brought male circumcision in line with the ancient practice of female genital mutilation, which among other things was intended to curb female sexual pleasure. Indeed, the Western version of this procedure was pioneered in the 1860s by English doctor Isaac Baker Brown, who performed hundreds of clitoridectomies in order to prevent his female patients from masturbating and preventing an illness known as hysteria. The work of Hutchison and Brown has left a long and controversial legacy. Recent medical studies of circumcision have found almost no medical benefits to the procedure, meaning that outside of religious tradition, the persistence of the practice in the modern world can be traced directly to a turn-of-the-century moral crusade against shuffling one's iPod. It would not be until the 1940s and 50s that the tide finally began to turn as the groundbreaking sexuality studies by researchers Alfred Kinsey, William Masters, and Virginia Johnson revealed just how common both male and female air guitar really was. <laughs> I feel like to the shock of absolute Nobody. For example, Kinsey's 1948 book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, and 1953 book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, collectively known as the Kinsey Reports, founds that a full 92% of American males and 62% of American females reported regularly are revving their own engines. A 2018 study by sexual health and wellness company Tango upped the latter figure to 76%, though as these figures are based on self-reported data and some are extremely uncomfortable admitting to such, the true numbers are thought to be much much higher. On that note, while these pioneering studies did much to destigmatize a perfectly natural practice, the process of societal acceptance has been a slow and difficult one. For example, the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, did not stop categorizing regular waxing on, waxing off as a mental illness until 1972, while in 1994, Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Joycelyn Elders, was forced to resign after suggesting that communing with nature be taught in school curricula is perfectly healthy and safe, and why on earth would we listen to the Surgeon General on such matters? But what does the modern medical establishment say? Can debugging one's hard drive really lead to madness, depravity, and a laundry list of health problems, as centuries of moral and medical authorities have so adamantly claimed? In a word, no. The plain truth is, decades of research have failed to find any major negative health effects of exercising one's right or left, as the case may be. All the myths about blindness, hairy palms, depleting one's energy are that. They're myths born out of centuries of religious and conservative fear-mongering. In fact, most contemporary health experts recognize a whole host of health benefits to exploring one's cave of wonders. For example, regularly giving yourself a low five can help map your own pleasure centers, discover what does and doesn't turn you on and gain mastery over your sexual impulses. This in turn can allow you to better communicate your desires and boundaries to sexual partners and build more trusting and fulfilling relationships. Solo or mutual manual labor can also serve as a convenient form of sexual release when one or both partners are too tired or otherwise unwilling to engage in regular intercourse and carries an extremely low risk of inducing pregnancy or passing on sexually transmitted diseases. On a more individual level, tenderizing your steak releases a flood of hormones and neurotransmitters such as neuroepinephrine serotonin, oxytocin, vasopressin, nitric oxide, and prolactin, which induce a sense of calm and relaxation and cause blood vessels throughout the body to constrict. This means that rubbing one out can be a convenient and effective treatment for insomnia, menstrual cramps, mild depression, headaches, and even nasal congestion. Yes, really. There may actually be even greater health benefits to taking the fifth. For example, a 1997 study by the University of Georgia found an inverse correlation between frequent ejaculation and death from coronary heart disease, while 2003 and 2008 studies by the Cancer Council of Australia found that men who frequently hunted the white whale were up to 33% less likely to develop prostate cancer. Previous studies found that frequent sexual activity actually increased the risk of prostate cancer by up to 40%, but once the effects of sexually transmitted infections were controlled for, this relationship was completely inverted. Though it is not yet known for certain what is responsible for this protective effect, researchers like Dr. Graham Giles of the Cancer Council Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, speculate that frequent ejaculation flushes the prostate glands of various carcinogens which normally accumulate there. A similar correlation has been found in women between frequent lactation and reduced risk of breast cancer, suggesting that the same mechanism may be at play. Right now, some of you are probably furiously typing into the comment section, what 
about addiction. Isn't it possible to get a little too fond of one-handed baseball? Well, here again the news is better than you might think, for while the uncontrollable urge to explore the final frontier is mediated by the same psychological and physiological mechanisms as drug addiction, psychologists hesitate to classify it as an addiction, preferring instead the term compulsive sexual behavior, which the most recent edition of the Internal Classification of Diseases, ICD-11, defines as, quote, a persistent pattern of failure to control intense, repetitive sexual impulses or urges resulting in repetitive sexual behavior. Thankfully, even this condition is only considered harmful or problematic if it interferes with the conduct of your everyday life. For example, if you frequently excuse yourself from social situations to go on dates with Pamela Anderson, or you do so in public, or if frequent compulsive five-knuckle shuffling negatively impacts your relationships with romantic partners. And even then, there is little evidence that making regular cash withdrawals leads to further sexual compulsion. So, in conclusion, so long as you're considerate about it and it's not interfering with your day-to-day -day life or relationships, feel free to stroke your bald head when you want, how you want, and how often you want. For as Woody Allen once so wisely said in 1977's Annie Hall, don't knock masturbation, it's sex with someone I love.